Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Douglas Murray, and I'm the Senior Manager of Cultural Services for the Town of Oakville and Vice President of the Creative Cities Network of Canada. I'm joined by my colleague, Ali Sabrin, who is the Senior Project Manager in the Culture Division for the City of Hamilton and also the Treasurer of the CCNC. Ali and I are pleased to be here this morning to speak to you about the Creative Cities Network of Canada, which I'll be referring to as the CCNC, as well as cultural planning in Canada. So in a way, Ali and I have two jobs. We have our paying jobs with our municipalities, or what you, many of you call local councils, and we have our role with the CCNC. So what is the CCNC? The Creative City Network of Canada is a national nonprofit organization that facilitates collaboration, knowledge sharing, research, and professional development for the cultural sector. Sorry. Are we moving here? There we go. <laughs> uh, sorry. That, uh, where was I? Through the development of cultural policy, planning, and professional practice. Our membership represents over 175 communities across the country, representing 16 million Canadians. We exist to connect and educate the people who do this work and share the working environment so we can be more effective in cultural development in our communities. By sharing experience, expertise, information, and best practices, our members support each other through dialogue, both in person and online. And as has been mentioned, 2017 was the 15th anniversary of the CCNC. The organization established itself as a not-for-profit in 2002 when it hired its first staff and subsequently moved to its own office in downtown Vancouver. The organization continued to take on research projects, began charging municipal membership fees, and started to receive annual project funding from the Department of Canadian Heritage and the BC Arts Council, which was crucial support for an organization that serves an entire country. This could not have happened without the wor work of Burke Taylor and Nancy Duxbury, who we have with us, who are both honorary members of the network as founders. Support from municipalities across Canada and the financial support from a number of cities like Vancouver, the Canada Council for the Arts, the British Columbia Arts Council, the Bronfman Foundation and the Department of Canadian Heritage helped get the organization started. And free office space was provided by the City of Vancouver in its early days. However, as many of us know too well, uh, priorities change, and while at the beginning we'd been very fortunate with funding, due to changes in government and priorities, funding no longer became available. However, the network was able to sustain itself as it had built a strong network of members and had become a vital and valued organization because we'd made our case. The goals of the CCNC were developed in partnership with our members. They are to support cultural development across Canada, to connect cities and those working in the sector across the country, to share knowledge, experience, and resource information with our members and stakeholders, and to enhance social, economic, cultural, and environmental sustainability. The values of the organization are up on the screen and guide the work that's done and help us meet our mandate and vision to the membership. And while I won't go into detail on all of them, I'd like to highlight collaboration it's one of the keys to the Creative Cities Network in Canada. One of our founders, Burke Taylor, has told a story many times about the early days of the Creative Cities Network, when there was a small network of people that started to connect and talk about cultural work and planning in Canada. They quickly realized how much knowledge there was out there. They just needed a way to share it. His story goes something like this. One day, there was an email sent out to a loose group of cultural workers from someone sitting in council chambers. It said, I was in council today. Someone asked about public art. Help, what can you tell me? And 15 people dropped a whole bunch of information on this person and gave them great advice. And a few days later, it wasn't many, the person came back with a message. I went to my report with, I went to council with my report on public art today. They think I'm a genius. <laughs> there was actually an expletive word in there, but I wasn't going to use it during the presentation. Um, and that's the power of collaboration, which continues to be one of the key values of the CCNC. So the Creative Cities Network is a lean organization with two streams, network services and our operations. The organization is driven by a working board that's supported by staff. 
Under the network services, we have four streams. Professional development, which includes the delivery of our annual summit and regional meetings. Research, which includes publications, our toolkits, and the cultural statistics strategy. A network hub, which involves our public art network and a festival and event network. And advocacy, through our awards program and also as a bridge to our members. Current advocacy work includes work with the Department of Canadian Heritage, but also, also happens when there's provincial uh, projects or strategies that are in, under, underway. Operations is led by a small staff team in consultation with the board and falls into the general categories of administration, finance and communications. I've mentioned we're a small organization. There are two full-time staff. We have a general manager and a national events coordinator that are based in Vancouver. We have a contract, some small contracts for a bookkeeper and our award program coordinator to keep the awards program separate from the administration of the CCNC. But it's the members and volunteers that drive much of the organization. We have a 15-member volunteer board of directors and all board members must sit on one or two subcommittees. The subcommittees are all chaired by a board member and the remaining positions are filled by board members and other interested members to ensure regional representation. This structure we found has always helped us because as board members move on, we have uh, board members, we have people who have worked on the committees that are able to then work their way to the board and continue the success of the organization. That succession planning, I think, is one of the reasons the CCNC has been so successful for the last 15 years. The Executive Finance Nominating Governance Committees take care of the administration of the organization while the membership committee works to ensure we reach out to as many members as possible and that we're undertaking initiatives to engage with our existing members. The Summit Planning Committee and Public Art Network organize our annual summit and the Cultural Statistics Strategy Working Group is our lead and conduit with the Department of Canadian Heritage and I'll discuss that project a little more later. Financial resources. I'm proud to say, and Ali as our treasurer is proud to, to hear, that we have a balanced budget. We have revenues and expenses of about $300,000. And the biggest sources of membership are, uh, sorry, the biggest sources of revenue are our membership and the funds raised through our annual summit. There is currently not any funding from provincial or federal levels of government. I'm going to talk a little bit now about our membership. We have a membership of 178 member organizations that include mostly cities, although some are individual members or cultural organizations. Our municipalities range in size from 3,000 to 2.8 million and cover 10 provinces and three territories. The Department of Canadian Heritage is the federal department in the Government of Canada responsible for policies and programming regarding the arts, culture, media, communication, languages, women, sports, and multiculturalism. As you can see, they have a broad mandate. And they run a broad number of agencies, but they're not always working at levels and programs that link with our cultural work at a local level. For example, the Department of Canadian Heritage may have a program that supports theatres through a presenting program, or capital improvements or renovations. However, there's no direct support for municipal or regional cultural planning or programming. In the provincial cultural ministries, mandates vary from province to province. For example, in my province of Ontario, we're the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport, while in Nova Scotia, it's Communities and Cultural Heritage. And you can see, while there is some alignment, the mandates and how that translates down into their local authorities varies greatly. Cultural, um, while Ali and I are lucky enough to be working in the cluster of memberships in southern Ontario, which is kind of that big cluster right down there um, by Michigan, uh, our colleague in Thunder Bay, who's up at the top of the lake there, is a 16-hour drive away from us. And if we were to drive to visit Kelly, who's our president uh, in Alberta, she's that dot up by the 28, it would take us 36 hours. So you can see that geography is something we always have to overcome. You'll also notice when looking at our membership map that we have strong representation on the west coast in British Columbia and also in the cluster I've talked about in southern Ontario. That's for a number of reasons. It's true that is where there's the largest density of population. We've also found that any areas that are clustered close together like that helps us with networking and we tend to be able to reach out to all of the local councils and get a strong membership base. 
Leadership from the provinces in both British Columbia and Ontario was very strong. Uh, in late, about 2008-2009, uh, there were fun was funding available in both British Columbia and Ontario from the provincial governments for municipalities to implement cultural planning, which really, I think, sparked a cultural planning movement in um, Ontario and BC as well as the summits. We've held many summits in both Ontario and BC, and we know that holding a summit helps us engage and increase our membership. So now just to talk a little more about Canada and our comparisons to you here in the Nordic countries. We're in the northern part of North America. Our provinces and territories, as you can see, extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific. We cover nearly 10 million square kilometers, making us the world's second largest country. And our border with the United States is the world's longest binational border. We're sparsely populated with 35 million people, and the majority of our land is dominated by forest, tundra, and the Rocky Mountains. We're highly urbanized. 82% of the 35 million people are in large and medium-sized cities, many near the southern border. The three largest metropolitan areas are Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Various indigenous peoples have also inhabited what is now Canada for thousands of years prior to European co colonization. And that's something that we're working with um, now through the Truth and Reconciliation Project in Canada. Canadians are known to be polite, peace-loving, and a stereotypical Canadian is depicted as one who apologizes just not, despite not being at fault. We value tolerance, diversity, and nonviolence. So Canada versus the Nordic, compared to the Nordic countries. We're known as the Great White North with a motto of sea to sea. And we searched for a motto for Nordic countries, and we couldn't find one, but we found the word huga, which broadly embodies an approach to living that embraces positivity and the enjoyment of everyday experiences. Combined Nordic countries have 3.4 million square kilometers and together form the seventh largest nation in the world. Uninhabitable ice caps and glaciers comprise about half of this area. We could place the inhabitable land of Nordic countries inside Quebec, our biggest province. And if the largest city, Stockholm, were in Canada, it would only be our fourth largest city. Nordic countries cluster near the top in numerous metrics of national performance, including education, economic competitiveness, civil liberties, quality of life, and human development. Your national values of cooperation, democracy, equal access to health, education, and social security make you among the most equal societies in the world. In terms of values, Canadians and Nordic countries are cousins. I'm now going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the services and programs that the CCNC offers its members. We constantly hear from our members that one of the most important roles in valued services is to connect them to information and each other. We do this in a number of ways, digitally, through our members portal, listserv and newsletter, and in person through our summit and regional meetings. Our members portal has been developed for members and is managed by our members. It helps them find one another, list primary contacts and other municipal contracts by field and position within their organization. It's managed by the members and it provides links to cultural plans, websites and other resources produced by municipalities. Members can also sign up for the listserv. The story I told earlier about the email was kind of the founding reason for our, our listserv startup. And it was an early feature of the Creative Cities Network. Due to changes in technology and websites, it had stopped for a number of years, but our members seriously called for it to return, and we now have five streams of open forum, public art, planning, events and festivals, and resources and research. Depending on your line of work, you can sign up for one or all. Members are very active posting questions, issues, and ideas for feedback. Um, and when uh, you can reply to the listserv, or if there's one of those touchy subjects that you'd like to respond on, but not reply all, you can reply directly to the contact. Most, uh, most posts get at least five and sometimes dozens and dozens of replies. 
Our member newsletters are sent out several times per month and feature information about the Creative City activities, but also profiles of member municipalities, initiatives, programs, projects, and successes. They really help our organization um, know what's going on and see the hot trends. Regional meetings. We hear from our meeting members that local connection is very, very important to them. And also that there are challenges in local municipalities traveling to the national summits. It's also different, difficult for large municipalities that have numerous staff to get approvals to send more than one or two people. So we aim to host two to three regional meetings per year to allow members in a province or region to connect. And they can also deal with trends of relevance in their region or geographic area. So, for example, the Creative Cities Network hosted an Ontario regional meeting during the development of the Ontario Cultural Plan. Uh, Vancouver, around the Olympics, had a meeting, uh, a regional meeting out there of CCNC members specifically targeted to public art around uh, the Vancouver Olympics. We try to focus hosting a regional meeting um, in advance of the summit to build memberships in that region. So next year's summit is in Saskatoon and we're focusing on hosting something in the Prairie region this next year. Saskatoon's smack dab in the middle of the country. So uh, it, it's, it's a challenge for us to um, get engagement um, in an area that's surrounded by very, very small municipalities. Learning opportunities are another key deliverable that we provide our members. Through toolkits and resources, the summit, peer support, networking, and research. As has been mentioned, and I hope you had a chance to look, check them out, we have created three toolkits. All of our toolkits are free, online, and available through the Creative Cities website. There's a cultural planning toolkit, which Ali and I will be going into much more detail about in this afternoon's workshop, and a cultural mapping toolkit both which were created in 2010 as a partnership between CCNC and Legacies Now, which was a funding stream in British Columbia. We also have a public art toolkit that's available on our website. Moving forward, we're hoping to secure funding to update the toolkits over the coming years and make sure that they're uh, continuing to be relevant with best practices. We're also going to develop a Truth and Reconciliation Best Practices Toolkit in, in, in support with and partnership with the uh, truth and reconciliation movement that's very active in Canada right now. And our toolkits, even though they're set eight years old, um, still this uh, page of our website uh, gets nine um, downloads per day. So I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about our summit. The annual summit is a highlight of the CCNC calendar, much like this conference is, I hope, for most of you. The locations follow a four-year call for proposals, and summits are supported by the host municipality financially and in kind, with host city staff acting as co-lead with a Creative Cities board member. Summits have four key areas, keynote speakers that speak to the big picture theme and set the stage for the conference, panel discussions that normally feature local speakers and are sure to, uh, we make sure to engage youth um, and uh, in Indigenous and um, unrepresented uh, communities in our panel discussions, peer-to-peer -peer presentations and study tours. The summits have a regional representation and I'm proud to say in the last five years we will have covered coast to coast. In 2015 and 2016 we were actually in BC back to back. In 2017 we moved to the um, Halifax, Nova Scotia on the east coast. This year's summit will be held in November in Mississauga, Ontario, right outside of Toronto. We'd love to see some of you there if possible. And in 2019 we'll be in Saskatoon. In addition to the keynotes, another aspect uh, of the summits is our peer-to-peer -peer presentations. They're an opportunity for communities to present best practices, successes, and case studies from their communities. There's a call in spring each year for our P2Ps. They're adjudicated by a committee and 16 to 20 are chosen to present 45 to 60 minute presentations at the summit. Regional and theme representation is uh, key and, and they're curated to ensure there are diverse themes. Study tours provide an opportunity for the host cities to showcase their cultural assets. We normally host at least eight sessions over two days with an opportunity for participants to choose two or three. 
Sometimes there's often a larger tour for all participants. They tend to be themed, dealing with issues like public art, heritage, events, and many are artist or curator led, and they take place as walking tours, bus tours, and last year we even had a culturally, uh, historic cultural boat tour. The public art stream has also become something very important in our summit. A number of years ago, it was added to the summit, beginning as a half-day pre-conference, and has now grown to a full day integrated into the conference. One of the new features of the summit added in the last few years is the public art year in review. Cities can submit their top public art projects for the year, and the committee selects the 10 most significant that showcase the best practices in the field. It's important to note, these aren't awards, we're not choosing the 10 best public art projects. We're choosing 10 projects that really represent the best of what is happening in the field. That may be due to community engagement, it may be a new approach that was used, or it may be that during the course of a public art project, that project had to overcome major hurdles. It's really featuring projects so that other municipalities can understand the processes of public art and how to make it happen in their municipalities. The summit also includes time for networking that includes a welcome reception, networking breaks, and evening activities. We hear from members over and over again that making sure they have time for that social and networking time is of vital importance to them. When they're primarily dealing with each other over email or teleconference, having that face-to-face -face representation is key. <laughs> Lastly, research is an important component in the CCNC history. Due to funding constraints, we've been limited in our ability to deliver research over the last several years. However, we are proud of recent partnerships with the Department of Canadian Heritage and Statistics Canada on the Cultural Satellite Account Project. We've also been leveraging opportunities to engage our members in research opportunities when available. One recent example was that, this creative, that we worked with Kelly Hill of Hill Strategies Research to do a comparative study of mid -si municipal cultural spending in mid-sized Canadian cities. So the way it worked is CCNC did a call out to all of its members to see who wanted to participate. Those municipalities that wanted to participate had a low dollar buy-in fee uh, to participate in the study and committed to providing um, information and were able to then get a comparator study that they could use um, for all of their municipalities. And I believe we had eight of our municipalities purchase um, buy into that. Oops, sorry. The Culture Satellite Account is an accounting framework created, uh, now I'm going to talk about the Culture Satellite Account and our project with the Department of Canadian Heritage. It's an accounting framework created to better measure the economic importance of culture, arts, heritage, and sport in the Canadian economy. The Culture Satellite Account is a new initiative based on the Culture Resource Framework, which is intended to foster a standard approach to the measurement of culture in Canada. The Culture Statistics Consortium is a national project made of members of diverse groups from all levels of government. Canadian Heritage, all of the provincial ministries, the Canada Council for the Arts, Library and Archives Canada, Telefilm Canada, the Cultural he Human Resource Council of Canada, the Ontario Media Development Corporation, the Ontario Arts Council, the British Columbia Arts Council, and us, the Creative Cities Network. Working with Statistics Canada, they've worked to make sure that we have the right numbers and the right tools. The provincial and territorial cultural indicators are timely estimates of the economic contribution of culture in Canada. In 2016, cultural GDP, gross domestic product, totaled $53.8 billion and equated to over 652,000 jobs in Canada. The largest contributors to culture GDP and jobs were in the audiovisual, interactive media, visual and applied arts domains, which included, among others, activities related to design, broadcasting, film and video. One of the other recent CCNC initiatives was our awards program, which was launched in 2016 with the goal of celebrating outstanding achievement of Canadian municipalities in the field of culture. Our annual award process is open to CCNC voting members in good standing. There's a volunteer peer jury process led by a third party contractor and the recipients are celebrated at the summit. We have four award categories, cultural planning, public art, cultural events and a leadership award. So what are some of the learnings that I can pass along to you if you're looking to start an organization like the CCNC? 
First, we hear from our members about the importance of communication. You need to make sure and to have mechanisms to share and exchange. The geographic scope of our membership is a big challenge, but there, so there is an importance of having some face-to-face -face meetings. We learned long ago that there's a value of an annual in-person planning session for our board and that our board orientation and making sure there are expect, um, we outline our expectations is key. As I've mentioned, we are a working board and when people do want to come into the organization, we need them to understand the commitment that that takes. The, uh, it's important for us to be clear of roles and responsibilities for board members, committee members and our staff. And so we've really worked hard in the last number of years to document, document, document all of the policies and procedures to ensure for succession planning and continued growth in the organization. Uh, I've spoken a little bit about terms of reference. Um, we also learned our office, as I mentioned, is in Vancouver, which is on one of the far coasts, uh, that there's a need for a local support for our staff team. And we always ensure that we have a board member in the greater Vancouver area who can provide that in-person support to our small staff team. Where are we going? We have a number of new strategic projects which we're in the process of prioritizing. We're in the middle of a digital platform expansion with a webinar pilot project happening later this year. We're investigating expanding cultural sector research. We're working to strengthen our support with the call to action as in the, identified in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. We're looking at uh, outlining the scope to update our, uh, our toolkits. And we're investigating collaboration and partnership opportunities with many other organizations. I'm now going to hand the podium over to my colleague, Ali, who will be speaking a little more about cultural planning in Canada right now. Good morning. Okay. Hello, I am here to talk to you today about research that I recently gathered on cultural planning in Canada for one main purpose, and that is to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer information sharing about cultural planning across the country. So here's the definition of cultural planning. Um, I'm not sure if this is hotly debated. This is, um, we pulled this from international expert Colin Mercer, and the key points are that it is strategic, it is integrated, and it supports broad goals of both economic and community development. <clears throat> Culture and cultural assets, we say, are one tool in our toolbox to address major city priorities, be they building neighborhoods, attracting immigrants, retaining youth, fostering creativity, or others. Okay. So the methodology was quite simple. I reached out to cultural planners through our CCNC. I just placed emails and phone calls and I was very happy that people were very willing to talk to me in short order. I contacted mostly current and incoming board member cities and there was only one qualifier. They had to have a cultural plan. The methodology entailed a 30-minute telephone interview. One did go an hour, but they were mostly 30 minutes. And I asked the same 22 questions to everyone. The questions were both open and close-ended in nature. And the calls were all held in the last quarter of 2017. And that's because I wanted to get Victoria. In, and they were having their plan go to council in December. So I thought I'd just wait for them. There are noted caveats, and I know there's many esteemed researchers in the room, and this, this work is nowhere near a quality professional level, but um, I'm going to point out some of the obvious um, limitations. First of all, this was a sample of convenience. It was a short reach for me to get these people to talk to me. The number of 22 is not statistically significant, and this is therefore more qualitative than quantitative in uh, nature, although I do use numbers, I know that they're not necessarily representative of like the whole country. I contacted 23 people and completed 22 interviews. That last person had a good reason. He was out of the country for the whole time. 
and most of the questions, because they were open-ended, the results are themed, and I'm the person who themed them, so I guess I just took liberties around what I thought sounded uh, similar and put like with like. And the responses provided, this is a very important one, are the opinions of the individual cultural planners and not official city positions. This came up time and again, people kept saying, don't quote Oakville or whoever on that. This is just my opinion as a cultural worker. So just keep that in mind. And if you will imagine that these chairs here are filled with these 22 people from across Canada. So the research questions, um, I know this doesn't add up to 22, but I'm just kind of clustering and I dropped a couple. Basically, um, what are your wins and challenges with your cultural plan? Did they have a community-based committee, like a round table that governs the implementation of their ongoing cultural plan? What were their top three opportunities and threats that they saw that were occurring across the country and elsewhere that would impact them in the near future? What was their biggest project now? An opinion poll on cultural planning, advice to cities without a cultural plan, and advice for cities updating a cultural plan. So the sample, similar to what Sarah said, um, it was a huge range. We're looking at the smallest community being of 5,000 people to the largest 2.7, so um, that's obviously Toronto. And so we did manage to get people from across the country, but there's a big clustering again in Ontario. It's a pretty good start. We did call, we call this our quick and dirty, but at least we have more than just Ontario, more than just three cities that uh, are shown here. So getting into the data now. The structure of local governments varies, as does the extent to which local cultural services are delivered. Some cities have regional governments that cover a wider territory and have narrower mandates, like, like, like public health alone, while others only focus on local government services such as urban planning. Others yet are amalgamated into what is known as single tier, Hamilton is one, and that's an Ontario term, and that combines both regional and local together. They have very big mandates. Culture and cultural services can take place in local or regional or this combined model. Most of the cities sampled, however, are lower tier. And culture's position in government org charts also varies widely. There are many variations, and the graphic here shows the common major departments. The most common in this sample is community services, followed by economic development, then parks and recreation, and, and then the city manager's office. And there's also some variations of this model that include things like, say, planning and economic development. The city sampled also vary in terms of when their first cultural plan was approved, and the range is 16 years, starting in 2001 all the way up to 2017. And the most common year, just by one with a little blip, was 2010. The majority of cultural plans have not been updated, and just over one quarter of them have been updated one time. In terms of giving updates to council, most cultural plans provide ad hoc or regular annual updates to council on the plan's progress. The other respondents vary in frequency from every two years to quarterly to being rolled up into higher level departmental or citywide reports. So what did the cultural planners cite as their biggest wins attributed to their cultural plans? The biggest win was more resources, followed by the evidence of fourth pillar thinking, then stronger community connections, and finally policy expansion. Within policy expansion, planners expressed that having an approved cultural plan provided credibility and set the foundation for more specific cultural policies. And by far, the largest policy expansion was in the area of public art, with one quarter of our planners citing that policy alone. The top response 
within the top win of more resources was an increase in the granting envelope, which makes up a large 45% of all planners. The next category, program expansion, has many interesting examples, such as a youth festival, artisan residence, cultural hotspot program, ethnocultural focus, their very first piece of public art, museum expansion, a new music office, a new arts awards, storytelling programs, and digital media art sector development. A few cultural planners also cited facilities such as new facilities plans, capital improvements, and simply more staff. What was theme under the second biggest win of the fourth pillar thinking? This theme captured a strategic approach to culture, which half of all planners cited, followed by the sense that there was a growing appreciation for culture. And finally, new partnerships, which includes working with universities and libraries, the cultural tourism sector, arts council, heritage council, and bringing a new design school into an older downtown. Now for the flip side. What did they say about challenges in implementing their cultural plans? Well, you're going to notice that there are many slices in this pie, and that shows there are a lot of different challenges. But there's also a few widespread challenges, and I will expand a bit on the four biggest slices. Almost all cultural planners cite limited resources as the top challenge, and half cite lack of funds specifically. While cultural plans do lead to increased resources, as I just mentioned in the wins, it still does not meet the demand. Prioritization was cited by half of the planners. There is a challenge with competing priorities, juggling many, many actions, working with the long-term nature of many of the plans, and also some actions, once they're started, never end. So you can't even cross it off the list. It's on your list forever. Working with other departments also was cited by half of the planners as a major challenge. It is something we must do, but it isn't always easy. In a nutshell and on balance, there's a feeling of achievement for significant wins, but also acknowledgement that we can do more and that our work is truly for the long haul, step by step by step. And don't worry, <laughs> you may think she didn't mention community engagement. And I didn't forget the second biggest piece of the pie, which was under this theme. As cultural planners, we know that community engagement is critical to developing successful cultural plans. The top concern is communication, which includes communicating the value of culture and that fourth pillar message to residents, arts groups, and other stakeholders. Four of the 22 cultural planners also cited challenges with engaging their cultural roundtables or those committees that are responsible for the ongoing nature of the implementation. For example, they start off very involved, attending all meetings, but they lose interest. And then they struggle to find a clear role or they just simply become less effective over time. The issue appears to be sustaining a meaningful role, and it was also noted that working with the community is a lot of work. You may be wondering how many respondent cities have this ongoing community committee to oversee the cultural plan. Well, quite a lot cited um, either having formal communities or having um, sort of one and or that they're developing one. So it seems like a lot, but if you take a closer look, the most common answer was sort of. And examples provided were really not the broad cultural um, teams that would look at the whole cultural plan holistically, but rather it would be working with their local arts council or a museum association or an external committee of council for a larger department or the city or even much more narrowly with just their public art committee. This is my favorite section of the research, and it's mostly because it was the easiest to tally. It took me five minutes. Everything else took weeks and weeks. But this, um, this is basically, I gave seven statements. They had to give me a score from one to five. Some gave a score and talked a lot, but I just didn't theme that part. I'm just showing you the score. And I ordered them from the most popular, um, having the most people agreeing with it, down to the least popular, but they're all significant. 
So the, the top answers in terms of agreement are cultural plans should be integrated into business planning activities. This doesn't mean that this is happening, it just means that everyone thinks that we should be doing this. A cultural plan is worth the effort, which is good because they are a lot of work. A cultural plan is key to positioning culture as key to quality of life. Also scoring highly was measuring the impact of culture. Without a cultural plan, culture's role is at risk of being diminished. We have made great strides in increasing the awareness of culture significance. And finally, mapping is as important as a cultural plan. This one had a little bit of debate. Some people said, well, I think it's important, but equally important, I'm not sure. So it's just because of the word equal that that one became a little um, lower on the list. So now we turn to the trends. The cultural planners were asked to identify those top three opportunities that they predict will impact their work in the near future. There were two top themes, and really they're super themes, and you'll see in a moment why, because there's so many things included under these. And the first one is innovation and partnerships. Examples included retaining students and being a teaching city, bringing universities into downtowns, the STEM to STEAM movement, I'm sure we've talked about this um, in more than just our city. It is a huge international movement. And in case you don't know what it is, it's adding arts to that discipline mix that's avidly promoted as key to competitive growth. And that is science, technology, engineering, and maths. Attracting creative talent and the idea that everyone will be a designer in the future and that creativity will be a top skill in the job market. And finally, incubators and creative hubs. There was a very big focus on universities and the overall discipline of innovation. The other theme tied for first is diversity, equity, immigration, plus truth and re reconciliation, which I'll be calling TRC. This theme also includes examples such as diversity inclusion plans, transculturalism, attracting diverse people, and being open to a new or changing vision of the changing community. Seven respondents specifically cited TRC, which is a commission in Canada with a mandate to inform all Canadians about what happened in the residential schools for the Aboriginal peoples. These government-funded, church-run schools were set up to eliminate parental involvement in the intellectual, cultural, and spiritual development of Aboriginal children, and they date back to 1870, with the last school closing in 1996, so pretty recently. The goal is to guide and inspire First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people and Canadians in a process of truth and healing. A summary report in 2015 was published with 94 calls to action, and it urged all levels of government to work together to change policies and programs to repair the harm caused by residential schools and to move forward with reconciliation. Other trends, so these ones have one in three people citing them, are around the measurement of culture. A very large collaboration that Sarah mentioned is the cultural statistics a consortium, and that involves all levels of government and many other cult cultural organizations led by the Department of Canadian Heritage. CCNC is the coordinating voice for local government, and this, um, this account, I also hear it's happening internationally, where it's basically, um, we use the the uh, framework for culture, and they went into the na they let us go into the national system of accounts and carve out all the pieces and say that's culture, that's culture, that's culture, and then we get GDP and job numbers. The digital economy is also on the radar, and this is huge as it relates to the fourth industrial revolution. According to Graham Flack, the Deputy Minister of Canadian Heritage, he says the culture sector is the most disrupted by the digital revolution. It will impact programs, access, plus digital economy, and it's also very tough to measure because it permeates borders so easily. In some ways, this theme could have been added to innovation as a super theme because it relates to open data, which is also a very cool use for cultural mapping, smart cities, and service delivery transformation. Another trend was an economic development focus, specifically cultural industries, which has been a trend underway in Canada for some time.
So now the threats. The top threat is funding, with most cultural planners citing that they fear austere budgets and competing priorities such as road repair or crumbling infrastructure will impact cultural planning. Others are worried that it is hard to keep up with the growth in the city. Four in ten planners cite the risk of shifting political support in addition to a lack of understanding of culture. Even cities that have very strong support from mayor and council today realize this can all change with the next election. There's also frustration that culture is not a mandated service, so it is theoretically prone to budget cuts. Another top threat is affordability in cities and competing local priorities. Affordability is viewed as causing problems for some in retaining artists. Some, some win and some lose in this mix. Um, and they're moving to cities that have lower real estate prices and um, also keeping up with cultural infrastructure needs. The biggest projects today are around the areas of facilities, cultural animation, social change, updating plans, collaboration, and policy and processes. And I won't bother reading these if the slides are available. Um, I can chat with you more about some of these big projects later. So what was the advice to cities who do not have a cultural plan? The biggest piece of advice was get one. The next piece of advice is to invest in resources. People stated that CCNC has helpful resources such as the toolkit and the listserv. In addition, they said hire a speaker or hire a dedicated FTE or full-time equivalent or staff person. Respondents also suggested to start somewhere, cultural mapping or just identify existing linkages or go broad or be specific. So there's a big range there, and I guess it all depends on what you have going on in your community. Advice to cities doing an update. The top advice is to take stock, look at what's worked, where the gaps are, and to seek out what's unique in your community, which is common sense. The next advice is to engage the community again and to develop a report card on activities and especially impacts. So I just want to reiterate a few pieces. I know I went through these quickly, just kind of um, what I think are key insights and reflections. Some of these are big trends and others are one or two off, which I think, um, which are still revealing, even though maybe only one or two people said it. First, consultation is getting tougher. We strive for inclusivity and we must reach it both wide and deep. We want to include a large number of cultures and our indigenous peoples. We want to reach people who do not normally engage. Um, we also honor interculturalism, where we look at both similarities and differences. And some people are simply tired of being consulted. We must break through all the, the chatter and clutter and all the meetings people are invited to. Next, the fourth pillar concept is both a big win and the next big trend. We strive for more collaboration with other departments and there are still inconsistencies in some practices such as bylaw enforcement where um, our staff go out and issue parking tickets to musicians who are unloading um, their drum kits and other equipment. It's really embarrassing for us because we want to be a music city. So we have to work within our goals and our cultural plan and still work on these policies that linger and make our work harder. World politics is also on the radar, even if we are local in nature. We acknowledge that we are not immune. One quote is that there is a compelling story for cultural planning in a discordant world, and also that there is an important role for culture with peace and tolerance. Which brings me back to the TRC. This was a very big, important theme that echoes respect and healing, and more culture departments are getting involved and even taking on lead roles in this. Also of note is affordability with big concern over real estate prices climbing and climbing and climbing. The fear is gentrification will drive away artists and creative talent or make it impossible to maintain the cultural assets. There's evidence of innovative solutions such as multi-use buildings and they were happening um, in Surrey, Calgary, and Oakville. A final insight is the growing demands of planning both wider, that is regionally, and also at a micro level, be it a smaller neighborhood or even a street. Added to this is the increased tension in balancing the needs of older downtowns with rural areas, new growth, and suburbs. 
As job, our jobs as cultural planners are becoming more challenging because we feel we, we must do it all. Examples of creative solutions include repurposing single-use older buildings into multi-use, pop-up cultural installations that delight in transit systems, local malls, murals and parks, public art and rec centers. So the answer to the question, would you like A, B, or C, is yes. Do I have time to go over? Am I over time? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we had a chance to compare this um, 22 planners research with other insights that are also very fresh and new. Um, first of all, there was a Nordicity workshop, and because they're a CCNC member, they invited CCNC members that are local. This um, meeting was held in Toronto, and um, I have some information that was shared in that forum to quickly highlight how it relates to our research and what was different. And there was also a recent article in Municipal World, which is a magazine across um, Canada that's really targeted to municipal workers. And it was in February 2018. So, so when we compare the Nordicity workshop, and they included speakers from Lord Resources, and these are uh, very respected uh, experts and consultants in the field, you'll see on the left the aspects that validate the findings from the 22 cultural planners. Added insights are in the middle column, that darker blue column. And they are, I think this one's really cool actually, I wanna do this. It is micro residencies. And the example is that this was in Dallas, Texas's cultural plan. And they embed an artist into each municipal department for one week. I think that is just an amazing idea. The workshop also offered very in-depth analysis and examples on facilities and options to address threats. It also included great insights into digital skills gaps and infrastructure gaps that we faced in the digital economy. On the right are a few unique aspects of the 22 cultural planners. Um, you may have noticed I went on and on about what I'm calling planographics, things like when the plan was um, first launched and things like that. And um, really, I'm emphasizing that this is just peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Nordicity also talked about cultural planning 2.0 into cultural planning 3.0. So in 3.0, there is greater integration with other municipal planning processes, which was featured heavily in the 22 planners, what I, I called the fourth pillar. Um, there's also a growing appreciation of the importance of partnerships between departments and the community and other sectors, which also echoes fourth pillar thinking. And they also um, very much mention innovation and partnerships, as did we. There was um, an article, as I mentioned, just last month in Municipal World written by Greg Baker. He's an expert as well in cultural planning in Canada. And while the article did have um, a little, yay, Canada, kudos, um, catching up, you know, great job that you're catching up, and maybe even caught up to Australia, which is considered a major leader in the field, really a lot of ink was invested in pointing out the criticisms and ways forward, things we can address to um, do better. So I'm going to say that these appear here in these boxes on the left, the five blue boxes. And they are that we must do more to operationalize a cultural lens, that we need both engagement and better data, that mapping remains an important activity and putting this data into municipal systems like the GIS never ends and is very, very important that we cannot forget the intangibles, namely the power of storytelling. And it's a reminder that we can not only promote culture for culture's sake, although this is still a mandate, we must do more to reflect culture in place-based place planning and things like promoting aesthetics and collective disc discourse on cultural issues and wins. The article also pointed out that cultural planning is still not a formal field in Canada, but there is promise to make us all legitimate yet. We also asked the 22 cultural planners, why are you compelled to keep doing cultural planning? Because let's face it, it's a long job for the long haul fraught with challenges. I pulled out my two favorite quotes that embody the motivations that make this work meaningful. They are, 
I do it because my city is important to me and culture is the heart of community. Culture bridges the past and the future. It is a tool to both disrupt and heal. It is ever optimistic and it is a vector for positive change. I'm done. <laughs> Are you moderating the session? No. You can use your microphone. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Mary So. I'm uh, from Turku University. Um, how much is the membership for these creative cities? And do the cities pay all the same, whether they are big or small? Yep. Great uh, question. Uh, no, we do have a tiered membership program where the large municipalities have a larger membership fee. I believe the largest for our major cities is 2,000? No, it's that. 2,500? So it's about 2,500 Canadian dollars. That's for the big cities. So Alley City falls in there, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. Um, the majority of our members are in the next tier down, which is mid-sized Canadian cities, uh, which is about a uh, membership of, I think, about 1,400 Canadian dollars. And then for our smaller cities, um, depending on population, it's anywhere from 500 uh, to $1,000. Uh, I think the lowest is 250 250 yeah. yeah, for the small. The, the, the cheapest price. <laughs> um, and the membership fee, uh, when we do our summits, uh, there's a pricing strategy for the summit, so members pay about $100, $150 less to attend the summit than non-members do. So there's a real incentive there as well. Okay, and who pays this? The municipality, the local council, normally out of the cultural, wherever the cultural services department lives. Uh, we also do have an individual membership uh, for people who are still involved in cultural planning and want to be part of it, as well as some organizations. Is there any qualifications that the city wants to be part of it? Do you have any criteria they have to meet or they can just participate? None. They can. If you're a city, you can join as a municipal member and then hopefully we'll get you to do a cultural plan or do more cultural programming as through what you've learned. Okay, I'm writing my thesis about UNESCO Creative Cities Network and have you heard or are you aware of this? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, actually our president, Kelly Jarrett, actually presented uh, at the UNESCO Summit in Korea this year. Okay, and do you have any collaboration with these people as well? It's mm -hmm. just to kind of start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very Actually, early. I think Nancy may have had, um, I, you may know that she really, like, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Nancy. Do you want to take that question? <laughs> or add to it, maybe? <laughs> okay. Um, who asked the question? Oh. Just so I can see where you Okay. <laughs> so I can see who I'm talking to. Um, the Creative Cities Network of UNESCO started after the Creative City Network of Canada. We were, I was involved in let's say, consulting or advising them, and they went off different ways anyway. At the beginning, I do? There we go. Is that better? At the beginning, they had six municipalities or six cities in the, in the UNESCO network, which was the problem, because you can't be a network with only six cities. Now there's um, many more, but it's, it, it might be changing now, but in large part, the cities that joined the UNESCO network were to market themselves as a UNESCO branded city, which is a very different motivation than joining to learn from your peers and to do more. We can talk later. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I, I have a, one question, which is a question of principle, but it's, uh, I think it's too long. We may want to discuss it outside this because I think we need time to can move on to the next workshops. But basically, for our discussion later on, it will be um, in what way is your model of cultural planning different than what we would call in the UK a cultural strategy, which is making the case for culture to contribute to local development. Whereas, in my view, cultural planning 
is about identifying the unique resources of a place and mobilizing these resources for providing priorities for development, engaging communities in moving in a new direction, having a vision for a city to move forward, which I think is beyond uh, cultural planning 3.0 probably, and it's not probably even cultural planning. And yet, I do use the same language. I use cultural resources, I use mapping, etc. But it feels like we are in a completely different dimension when I push cultural planning into this idea that culture is one element in that, but industry is equally important, history is equally important, the intangibles that Greg, Greg Baker mentions in that are very important to me because they tell you what the spirit of place is. Um, and then whether the creative industries are doing well or not in a particular city is important to me, but it's one element. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a big so, topic. That's another, <laughs> yeah, that's for another day, probably. But I think I, I just needed to say so because uh, I've been so much part of the debate about cultural planning. I contributed to Municipal mm -hmm. World um, articles and debated yeah. with Greg Baker and for I a long time. I will say time. it's still hotly debated, and I think um, we're kind of settling on you. There's a wide range of ways to cultural plan, and I think the toolkit points out the different types of cultural plans. You're right. Even now, it's like that's not a cultural plan. No, it's a cultural plan. So. Um, it depends on also your community and how you're structured. So it, it gets really complicated, but I think they're all plans. Yeah. 